So this video is going to be on the ratio test for convergence of an infinite series. So we'll begin by stating what the ratio test says, and then we'll spend the rest of the video trying to understand why it's true. So the ratio test then. So if we have a infinite series, sum from i is equal to 1 to infinity of a i, and we want to know whether this series actually converges to a finite value or whether it diverges off to infinity. One of the tests that we can use to try and answer that question is the ratio test. Now, the ratio test will not tell us what the actual sum adds up to. Uh, it merely tells us, or can tell us, whether it converges to something or whether it diverges off. In some cases, it will be inconclusive, and in some cases, it won't be possible to actually uh, compute the limit. Uh, but in the cases where you can use it, it may be able to give you some very valuable information. So the ratio test says that if you're able to find this limit, limit as n approaches infinity, of the modulus of am plus 1 over an, and we often call that rho, so it's the uh, limit of this sequence of the size of the ratios between the terms or the ratio between the terms where you're just interested in how big the terms are rather than whether they're positive or negative. So we could actually write out this sequence. So the first term is going to be a2 over a1, the absolute value of that. The next term is going to be, we put in 2 this time, so a3 over a2, and so on. So it's this great big sequence of the ratios of the terms that are in our series. If that sequence has a limit, we can call that rho. And then the ratio test says that if rho turns out to be greater than 1, then you can conclude that the series is divergent, i.e. Um, it adds up to something that diverges off to uh, infinity or negative infinity. If rho is equal to 1, you can't conclude anything, so the test is useless, it's inconclusive. And we'll look at two examples where rho is equal to 1. One where the um, series diverges off, it equals plus infinity, and another one where it does actually converge to a finite value. Um, so there are examples for both, uh, so you can't conclude anything. And then finally, when rho is less than 1, and remember of course rho is always going to be a non-negative value, it's going to be 0 up because it's a sequence of absolute values, so these are all going to be non-negative. At the very lowest they're going to be 0, so the limit is never going to be a negative number, so we're just dealing with the non-negatives here. But if rho is less than 1, then you can conclude that the series is convergent. So let's explore now why this is true. So we're going to use a lot in this video the Cauchy criterion for the convergence of a infinite series. So remember that the sum of an infinite series is really the limit of the partial sums. So we're really looking at the limit as uh, n approaches infinity of what we can call Sn, and those are just brackets, not absolute values, where Sn is the partial sums, so it's the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of the ai. So writing a little bit of this sequence out, uh, the first term would just be um, S1, where you'd have just added one term, so it would be a1. The next term would be a1 plus a2. The next term would be a1 plus a2 plus a3, and then the nth term would be a1 plus a2, all the way up to plus a n, and it would go on forever. So this sequence of partial sums, if that sequence has a limit, i.e. it gets closer and closer and closer, indefinitely close, and stays indefinitely close to some value, some finite value, um, then that is what uh, the value of the infinite series is going to be. Now, 
That's important because then we can apply the Cauchy criterion for the convergence of a infinite sequence. So we know in the real numbers that Cauchy sequences and convergent sequences are one and the same. So um, all convergent sequences are Cauchy and all Cauchy sequences are convergent. So this sequence of partial sums is going to have to be a Cauchy sequence, and then we can see what that means in terms of uh, the sums of the terms of the series, and that gives us the Cauchy criterion for the convergence of an infinite series. So, applying then the criterion to be a Cauchy sequence, it says that the terms of the sequence must get and stay indefinitely close to one another and the rigorous way that you capture that or the symbolic way that you capture that is you say however close you want to get it so for all epsilon greater than zero so however small a positive number you pick uh, it must be the case that there exists a point in the sequence so there exists some big n which is an element of the natural numbers such that for all the points of the sequence beyond that, uh, and we're going to need two of them, so for all n1 and n2, which are greater than or equal to big N, if you look at the uh, distance that those terms of the sequence are from one another, so s n1 minus s n2, and actually, um, no, we'll leave it like that, um, it is going to be less than epsilon. So uh, if we draw out a picture of our series of partial sums, and I'm not going to, uh, in fact, that, you no, know, actually, initially I won't write it out in terms of what it actually is. We'll just write S1, S2, etc. So we have this sequence of partial sums. What this is saying is that there exists some point, no matter what epsilon you give me, there must exist a big N, and it will depend on the epsilon. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that, actually. Some S big N here. There will exist some point in the sequence, some big N, and this is the term in the sequence, S big N, such that at that point, and for all the points beyond here, so little n1 and little n2 are two points of the sequence beyond here, two, any two points beyond here, that... There, if you look at how far apart they are, it's going to be less than epsilon. And it has to be the case that for whatever epsilon, you can find a point in the sequence that satisfies that condition that any two of the terms of the sequence, if you look at how far apart they are, they're smaller than that epsilon. Now, um, we can now think of these actually as the partial sums, and then we can get a formula in terms of the terms of the actual series. So Sn1, uh, and let's imagine that Sn2, so we'll, one of M1 and N2 is bigger. So just for the sake of argument, for the sake of a picture, really, we'll say that M1, sorry, N2 is the larger one. So we'll say N2 is larger than M1. Then if we think about what the actual difference between Sn2 and Sn1 is, and I've written this as Sn1 minus Sn2, but of course it's the absolute value, so you could write it either way around. So we could imagine Sn2 minus Sn1, and indeed that's what I'm going to do now. Um, so the difference between them is just going to be all of the things that you haven't yet added on. So remember, Sn1 is going to be A1 plus A2 all the way up to An1, whereas Sn2 is going to have gone further. It's going to be then all of that plus An1 plus 1 plus An1 plus 2 plus all the way up to An2 because just for the sake of argument, we've assumed that N2 is the bigger of the two. So therefore, the difference between these two terms is just going to be all of these terms that we haven't yet added on when we're looking at Sn1. So Sn2 minus Sn1, which, um, and of course we want the absolute value there, so we'll keep that, is going to be the absolute value of all of these terms added on, because when I almost dropped the absolute value, but of course we're not assuming that all the terms of the series are positive, they might be negative, all of these extra terms here might be negative, 
Uh, so we want we need to keep that absolute value there. So it will be a n one plus one plus a n two plus two the next term along plus all the way up to a n two. So what we can now do is plug that in then instead of having our SN1 and SN2 now into here. And we've now got a nice criteria in terms of the terms of the series. So the Cauchy criterion for series then is going to be that no matter how small you want, there is a point in the sequence of the terms of the series where for all of those terms afterwards, if you add them together, if you take any collection of them added together, and it has to be an ordered uh, addition, you can't just take any collection, it has to be, uh, you know, they have to, a successive addition, um, all of those little sums, they have to be less than epsilon, so we'll write this out in full. Mm. So if our infinite series ai sum from i is equal to 1 to infinity is going to converge, it must be the case that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists some point in the sequence of the terms of the series, big N, and that will depend on epsilon, such that for all little n, and we need little m1 and little n2 that are greater than or equal to big N, and again, for the sake of argument, we'll assume n2 is the bigger one, because one of them will be bigger. So I'll just uh, label the bigger one n2 and the smaller one m1. Um, so I'll put that in brackets. Um, that the absolute value of the sum from i is equal to n1 to n2 of the ai is less than epsilon. And all that I've done is replace this sum here with what it is in a fancier notation. So we're doing the sum from, uh, oh, and I've actually made a little mistake there. It should be from i is equal to uh, a, uh, to i is equal to n1 plus 1. So that one there, all the way up to n2. If we'd done n1, then that would be slightly incorrect because n1 would have been subtracted off by subtracting off the uh, s m1. So from i is equal to n1 plus 1 to n2, that must be less than epsilon. And that must be the case no matter what n1 and what n2 you pick um, that are greater than this point in the sequence of the terms of the series. Now, one of the first things we can conclude from this is we can just take n2 equal to n1 plus 1, and in that case, all of those differences between the partial sums are just going to be one term, and we can therefore immediately conclude that the um, size of each of the terms, so if, for instance, uh, so the difference between Sn2 and SM1 is going to equal this in that case. So if N2 is just equal to M1 plus 1, then when you subtract off SM1, you'll get every other term of the sequence apart from that top term, which will be AN2. Uh, and now, because this has to be true, um, we can conclude that this has to be less than that epsilon. And as this holds for a general epsilon, you can conclude that each of the terms of the series has to get indefinitely small. So rewriting this out, just using this case that we let n2 just equal m1 plus 1, which is one of the cases of this, it's perfectly valid under this. Rewriting this out, we now get that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a big N is an element of the natural numbers such that for all, and now we can drop the two, we can just use one n, so for all n greater than or equal to big N, um, the absolute value of a n is less than epsilon. So this is a weaker condition than this. This is much more powerful, much more complicated. All we've now done 
is let the n2 just equal n1 plus 1. And then applying that into here, it tells us that each of these is going to be less than epsilon. So we've rewritten that out like fo as follows. So what we've got is that no matter how small you want, there exists a point in the sequence of terms of the series. I'm just writing out a picture to help with this understanding. So we've got the terms of the series here in a great big sequence. What this is saying is no matter how small you want, there must exist a point in this sequence of terms, so some a n, where for that one and for all terms after it, so the general a little n is any term after it, any subsequent term, their size must be less than that epsilon. So the size of the terms of the series must get and stay indefinitely small. And we could write that another way. The limit, um, and we'll use n, as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of the terms of the series must equal zero. Because that's exactly what this, what we've managed to extract from that Cauchy criterion. Um, that this sequence of terms of the series must get and stay indefinitely small, and that's the same as the limit of it uh, equaling zero. So what does this have to do with the ratio test? Well, we're going to use this to show uh, part of the ratio test, uh, and then we're going to use the more general uh, Cauchy criterion to show the other part. So we're going to start actually, when I find it again, uh, with the easier part which is this part here, that if rho is greater than 1, then the series is going to be divergent. And the reason we're going to be able to show that is when rho is greater than 1, it's going to disobey that criterion that we've just shown, that the limit of the terms of the sequence uh, must go to 0. Um, and that is something that must be obeyed in order for the series to be convergent. If that doesn't occur then there's no chance that it's going to obey the Cauchy criterion for convergence, and therefore it's not going to converge. So let's do that. So rho is greater than 1. We'll make some space over here. So what we can consider then is this sequence of the absolute values of the terms of the series. So the absolute value of a1, absolute value of a2, absolute value of a3. Now, of course, if all the terms of the series are positive, then this sequence is going to be exactly the same as just the sequence of the terms of the series. However, we're not making that assumption. The series could be much more complicated than that. Remember, series where all the terms are positive are very simple because they're going to have sequences of partial sums that are monotonically increasing. So all you need to do in order to know whether they converge or not is prove that they are bounded. As long as they're bounded, then they're monotonically increasing and bounded, and then by the monotone convergence theorem, they are going to converge to a limit. Uh, so we're dealing with more complicated series than that, where the terms might be positive and negative, and therefore the sequence of partial sums is not necessarily uh, going to be monotonically increasing, or indeed isn't going to be monotonically increasing if they're positive and negative. So uh, for the more general case, we need to think about this series of... Um, the absolute values, sorry, the sequence of the absolute values of the terms of the series. Now, what we have just shown is that if there's any hope that the series converges at all, then the limit as n approaches infinity of this sequence, mod a n, must equal zero. What I'm going to show is that if rho is greater than one, that's not going to happen. So, Rho is greater than 1. Now, remember what rho was equal to. It was the limit as n approaches infinity of mod a n plus 1 over mod a n. And, of course, by the property of moduli, that is just the limit as n approaches infinity of mod a n plus 1 over mod a n. So, in terms of our picture... What this is, is it's a sequence of these ratios of the terms. So our sequence of absolute values, if we look at the ratios of the terms, that first ratio, and there's not much space, but it's the modulus of oops, 
a2 divided by the modulus of a1. This second term, its ratio is the mod of a3 divided by the mod of a2. And then looking at the general term, an, with its subsequent one, an plus 1, their ratio is going to be this general ratio, an plus 1 over mod an. Now we're saying that when you look at this sequence of the ratios, that it's converging to something that is greater than 1. Now just applying the definition of convergence with a picture, if we have our number line here, here is 0, here is 1, this limit, rho, is greater than 1. Now, if this sequence converges to that, that means that it gets and stays indefinitely close to rho. So therefore, there is going to be some point where all the terms of that sequence are most definitely greater than 1. So what we can do is say, um, let, let's choose an epsilon such that that epsilon is not bigger than this gap between 1 and rho. So choose epsilon so it's smaller than that. Then rho minus epsilon will be greater than 1. We can call that so that it has a simple name. We can call it r. And by the definition of convergence of this sequence, there will be a point. There will exist a big N is an element of the natural numbers such that for all little n is greater than or equal to big N that the points or the terms of this sequence are within the epsilon interval around rho, i.e. they are greater than this r. So such that uh, for all n is an greater than or equal to big N, the these ratios, so a n plus 1 over a n, are greater than this r, which is in turn strictly greater than 1. So this isn't complicated. All I've done is actually um, make concrete what I said earlier about the fact that if these ratios are converging to rho, then there is a point in that sequence of ratios where they are all strictly greater than 1. And to make that concrete, I've said there's a point where they're all strictly greater than this thing R, which is strictly greater than 1. And I've just extracted that directly from the definition of convergence of a sequence. But hopefully from just the, def the intuition of what it means to converge to rho, you understand this, that uh, there is going to be a point in that sequence of ratios where they're all strictly greater than this r here um, as they're getting closer and closer to rho. This allows us to disprove this as follows. We can draw a picture. So let's have all of our terms redrawn out. So mod of a1, mod of a2, and then it goes on. And now what we're saying is we have some point um, n. So here's mod of a n, and then we have mod of a m plus 1, and so on. And now at that point, and for all things beyond it, this ratio between terms, so of course this ratio is going to be mod of a m plus 1 over mod a n, and then you'll have the next one along. All of these ratios are going to be uh, strictly greater than that r. So if we just put some more on here, so I'll put mod of a m plus 2 here, and then the ratio between those two is a m plus 2 over mod of a n. And then we can go on. So we can imagine going on to some general term, uh, a n plus i, up here. Now, all of these ratios are going to be strictly greater than r, which is strictly greater than 1. Now, what this allows us to do is compare it with another sequence of terms, 
which is this sequence here. So mod a n, and then the next one along will be mod a n times this number r. The next one along will be mod a n times this number r but squared. And then the general one, a n plus i, that will be compared to mod a n times r to the power of i. Now what you can say is that because all of these ratios are actually going to be strictly greater than this r, which is greater than 1, all of these terms are going to be greater than the term that you're comparing them to. Because if you look at how you would get from here to here, you're going to be multiplying it actually by something that is greater than r. And because these things are greater than 1, when you multiply them by them, things are going to get bigger. So this bigger ratio here is going to mean that this term is actually bigger than this one because you've multiplied it by a bigger number. Then when you get from this term to this term, again you're multiplying it by something that is greater than r, so the amount by which it's getting bigger is going to be bigger than r, so it's certainly then going to be bigger than this because this one was bigger than this and then you've multiplied this sorry, this, by something bigger than what you've multiplied to get from here. So you're always multiplying by something smaller down here than you would be up here. So these corresponding terms up here are always going to be bigger than the term down here. So you can have inequality signs like so. And this is a problem because now if we think about what the limit of this sequence of absolute values of our series terms actually is, so limit as n approaches infinity of mod a n, well, we know that these terms, at least after this point, and this point, you know, there's only a finite number of terms that we can't use this for, but all the, the rest of these terms uh, this applies for, um, so if you like, we're just doing the series from n is greater than or equal to big N Onwards, but that doesn't matter because, you know, the limit of the entire sequence is the same as the limit of this terminal part of the sequence. The first finite number of terms doesn't matter. It's what happens to all of these. So this is going to be the same as the limit of the entire thing. Um, for that, for these terms, a n is going to be strictly greater than. Um, this sequence that we've got here, I'm trying to think what's the best way of writing this out. I suppose it would actually be, um, let's scrap this and start again. So we'll go down here. So we'll do the limit as i approaches infinity of mod a n plus i. And this is going to be the same thing as the limit as n approaches infinity of the entire sequence. Um, and the reason that this is actually something we can now prove isn't going to go to zero is because all of these terms, a m plus i, they're going to be greater than this term, a n, r to the power of i. So therefore, the limit of this sequence is going to be greater than the limit of this sequence, but that sequence doesn't converge to something. It's divergent because r is greater than zero. This is the geometric sequence, the geometric progression. And when r is smaller than one, that will shrink down to zero. But when r is greater than one, that blows up to infinity. So this sequence is going to also blow up to infinity. So it's not going to go to zero. Uh, and therefore, that series cannot converge in the case that rho is greater than 1. So just writing that out, so this limit is greater than the limit as i approaches infinity of mod a n r to the i, but as r is strictly greater than 1, this thing goes off to plus infinity, uh, and therefore this thing is even bigger, so it can't converge to a finite value either. Uh, and as that is equal to that, as I hope I've convinced you, you know, that uh, the limit of this tail part of the sequence is the same thing as the limit of the entire sequence. Uh, therefore, it cannot satisfy this criteria that the limit of the mod of a n is equal to zero. 
which is something that is absolutely necessary to be true if the series is going to converge. So from the fact that rho is greater than 1, we were able to get all of this, which disproves this. Uh, and that worked for the general series. It didn't require all of the terms to be positive because we were working with the absolute values of the terms here. So we'll now move on to the case when rho is less than 1. Uh, and we'll come back to the case when rho is equal to 1 at the end. Uh, we'll go on to this case. We want to prove that when rho is less than 1, that implies that the series is convergent. So to do this, we're going to use something called absolute convergence, which comes from the Cauchy criterion. So we're going to use what we showed here earlier on. So in case you haven't ever seen the concept of absolute convergence before, I'll take you through it. So if we have some infinite series from i is equal to 1 to infinity of a i, and we're not assuming all of the terms are positive, they could be mixture of positive and negative, if the infinite series of the absolute value of the terms of the series, so from i is equal to 1 to infinity, so make all the terms of the series now positive, get rid of the ones that have the negative sign, get rid of their negative sign, turn them into their positive selves, and take that series instead. So now you've got uh, an infinite series of all positive terms, a monotonically increasing sequence of partial sums. If this converges, then you can also conclude that the original series converged. So there's a word for this. We say that the series is absolutely convergent, and we would call it an absolutely convergent series. And all that means is that the series of the absolute value of the terms converges. And if that's true, then you can conclude that the actual series itself converges. So this gives that the original one converges, and I want to prove that to you. And the reason this is so helpful is because for our case, we can then just consider taking the all the terms absolute value and then we've got a series that is all positive is monotonically increasing and in order to show that that converges all we need to show is that it's bounded above uh, and then we've got that it converges when they're a mixture of positive and negative and then you don't have this monotonically increasing sequence of partial sums it's much more complicated so we're going to use this massively so this comes from the Cauchy criterion so if we assume, or if we know that this converges, we're going to show that this converges, that's what we're going to prove. So we'll start off by writing down what we know from the fact that this converges. So if this converges, it must obey the Cauchy criterion. So we'll write this down. So we're starting off with the assumption that the sum from i is equal to 1 to infinity of the absolute value of a i converges. That means that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a point in the sequence of the terms of the series, a big N, which is an element of the natural numbers, such that if you take any two points of the sequence of partial sums beyond there, or if you look at the sum between any two little m1 and little n2s that are greater than uh, big N, so such that for all little n1 and little n2 that are greater than or equal to big N. And again, we'll assume that little n2 is the bigger of the two. One of them is bigger. So we'll just call that one the n2, and then the smaller one we'll call m1. Um, it must be the case that the sum from um, i is equal to n1 plus 1 to n2 of a i, um, or mod a i, is of course the terms of the actual series, um, is going to be less than epsilon. So writing this out in full, it would say that a n1 plus 1 plus a n1 plus 2 plus all the way up to, oh, and they should have absolute values around them, all the way up to a n2, all of that is less than epsilon. And the fact that this converges means that no matter what epsilon you pick, 
for all of them, there exists this big N such that if you take any two little Ns that are greater than that and look at these sums, they're always going to be less than epsilon. So that's what we know from the fact that that converges. Now let's think about what we need to know in order to prove that our original series, our non-absolute value version of the series, converges. So we want to show this converges, show this converges. So in order to show that converges, we need to show that it obeys the Cauchy criterion. So we need to show that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a big N is an element of the natural numbers such that for all little m1 and little n2 are greater than or equal to big N, and again we'll assume that little n2 is the bigger of the two, that these sums are less than epsilon, but this time of course the sum is going to be not of the absolute values, it's going to be the sum of ai from i is equal to n1 plus 1 all the way up to n2 and now instead it's going to be the absolute value of all of that must be less than epsilon. Now in case you're wondering why I've put the absolute value there, remember the actual definition of the convergence of a Cauchy sequence. You want the absolute value of the difference between terms. So in the case that all the terms were positive, as was the case up here, I didn't feel the need to put an absolute value sign around there, but really I could have done. If I was being completely formal, I would have put an absolute value sign around there. Of course, it doesn't matter because all the terms are going to be positive in that case. So the absolute value of that sum is still just going to be the same as that sum. So that's the reason I dropped it there. But really there should be an absolute value around all of this because you're looking the positive version of the difference between the two terms. It's just the case that we knew that that difference would be positive, so it didn't matter about having an absolute value around there. Now in this more general case, when looking at the difference between these two partial sums, Sn2 and Sm1, that difference is going to be this sum, but that difference might be negative. You know, if these terms are negative here, then we might end up with a negative value here. So we need to then take the positive version of that and its size needs to be less than epsilon. Because of course, if this is something like, you know, negative two million, uh, if we didn't have the absolute values there, of course, it would actually be less than epsilon because epsilon is some positive value, but that isn't what we mean by the convergence. We want the size of it to be less than epsilon. We want its modulus to be less than epsilon. Um, so of course, 20 million or whatever I said wouldn't have a size less than this potentially tiny epsilon. So it is important to have that absolute value there. Uh, so this is the brilliance here. This is what we need to show, given that we know this. Um, but then by the triangle inequality, this is always going to be smaller than this sum here. And therefore, we can just set our big N that we need here to equal the same as whichever big N you had that proved it in the absolutely convergent case. So writing some of this down, so this sum, the absolute value of the sum from i is equal to m1 plus um, 1 to n2 of ai, this is going to be less than or equal to the sum from i is equal to n1 plus 1 to n2 of mod ai, and the understanding of that is perfectly simple. So if you consider adding a bunch of things together, so just to make it simpler, we'll just have a1 all the way up to some an. Now, imagine that these are uh, a mixture of positive and negative. So if you consider making them all positive by taking their absolute values, a1 plus a2, plus all the way up to a n, and you call that sum s, then if you plot that on the number line, so if we have zero here, let's say this is s up here. Now, 
If you then made all of them negative, so this time instead of making the negative ones positive, make the positive ones negative so that they're all negative. So what you'll instead get is minus the absolute value of a1 plus minus the absolute value of a2 plus onwards to minus the absolute value of an. So we've made everything negative. Of course, the answer you'll get is then negative s. So we can plot this on the number line here, negative s. So this is the sum that you get when all of them are positive. This is the sum you get when all of them are negative. So when they're a mixture of positive and negative, it's going to be somewhere inside of there. Um, it's not suddenly going to magically add up to something that's bigger than s. How could it? Because that's the maximum you can get to when absolutely every single one of them is positive and they're all, you know, stacking in the same direction. If you imagine them all the little arrows pointing in this direction if they're positive and this direction if they're negative, if they're all pointing in the same direction and it's this way, this is the maximum that they can get to. If they're all pointing in the same direction and it's this way, they're all negative, then this is the maximum place they can get to. If you've got a mixture, then they're going to counteract each other and you're going to end up somewhere in the middle. And therefore, when you look at the absolute value of this sum, it cannot possibly have a modulus bigger than this. It's going to be somewhere within these two and therefore its modulus is going to be less than or equal to this. Now, of course, if they're all positive in this case, so then taking their absolute value was unnecessary and therefore the answer on both sides will be the same. But in the case where some are positive and some are negative, this is going to be less than this. Now, from the fact that this series converges, that was our assumption that this converges, we know that we can make these things indefinitely small. So however small you want, you can find a point uh, in the sequence of the terms such that these sums are all going to be smaller than that epsilon. Oh, I keep clicking things that I don't mean to click. I apologize for that. Here we are back again. So as all of these things are smaller than that thing, and you can make this indefinitely small, then it's going to be true that you can also make this indefinitely small. So in particular, if you need to find this big N such that this is going to be true, just use the exact same big N that you had from this being true. Because if you use that exact same big N, you know that this thing is strictly smaller than this thing, and that this thing is going to be smaller than your epsilon. So to prove this, you have to show that for a general epsilon, you can find this big N. By the fact that this is true, for a general epsilon, you can't, there does exist a big N. So you can just take the big N from there and then apply it in here. And because you know this is going to be less than or equal to this thing, and you know this thing is going to be less than your epsilon, you then have that this is less than epsilon by transitivity. So that is why if this converges, you can also then conclude that this converges because you can conclude that this does obey the Cauchy criterion for convergence of an infinite series. I'm now going to look at the case when rho is less than 1 and show how we can use this uh, to prove that our series is going to be convergent. So let's write this out then. So we have our infinite series sum from i is equal to 1 to infinity of a i and what we know is that rho is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of mod a n plus 1 over mod a n and we know that this is now less than 1 and what we want to show is that that implies that this is going to be convergent. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to show that the absolute version of the series is convergent so mod of a i is going to be convergent if this is true and then by what we've just shown that will then imply that this is convergent. And the reason that this is going to be so much easier is because now it's a monotonically increasing sequence of partial sums. So now this, even though it looks scarier with the absolute value signs around it, it's actually much simpler because now all the terms of the sequence uh, of terms, sorry, all the terms of the series are going to be non-negative and that means that the sequence of partial sums is going to be monotonically increasing and therefore in order to show that it converges all you need to show is that it's bounded above. 
way we're going to do that is by bounding it by the geometric series. So let me show you. So if we write down the sequence of terms of the series, so we've got, we're now dealing with this sequence of absolute values. So we've got A1 mod A2 mod A3 and so on. Now, the fact that this limit exists and is less than 1, we're going to use that now. So, similar to what we saw earlier, if we draw a little number line here, here's 0 and 1. So our limit is now strictly less than 1, so here is rho. Now, the fact that this sequence of ratios converges to this means that it gets and stays indefinitely close to that, so there is going to be some point in this sequence of ratios where at that point and for all the points afterwards, they are strictly less than 1. In particular, what I can do is pick an epsilon that is smaller than that gap between rho and 1, and then I can consider rho plus epsilon. So here's rho plus epsilon, and that's now something that's strictly less than 1. And I realise that my arrow is actually pointing to 1 there, so let me just get rid of that. So it's, it's this thing here. That's rho plus epsilon. We could rename rho plus epsilon some r to make things simpler. So by the definition of the convergence for this sequence, I can say that, I'm not going to write for all epsilon, so there will exist a big N in the natural numbers such that for all little n is greater than or equal to big N, that those ratios are now going to be strictly less than that r. So mod a n plus 1 over mod a n is going to be less than r, which is itself less than 1. So just in case you haven't understood that, so r is this point here that is less than 1. I've said that r is going to be rho plus some small amount epsilon, and then I'm just using the definition of convergence with this epsilon that is the difference between rho and r, um, and I'm saying that if this converges to rho, then there must be some point, big N, in the sequence such that for, all, for that point and all points beyond it, that all of the terms of the sequence, all of these ratios, are inside that epsilon interval around rho, and that means that, of course, they're going to be less than r, which is the upper bound of that interval, that epsilon interval around rho, and r itself is less than 1. Adding that onto our picture here, so there is going to be some point here, and here is that first term after that point, so a big N, where for all of these terms subsequent, so here is a n plus 1, and then we'll have a big N plus 2, all of these ratios, so here's a ratio mod a n plus 1 over mod a n, and then the ratio between these two is mod a n plus 2 over mod a n, all of these ratios are going to now be less than this r, which is less than 1. And just like we did for the divergence case, we can now compare these terms of the series to terms of a geometric series, only this time the r is actually going to be less than 1, and therefore is actually going to converge up to something when you add them all together. So let's do this. So we can compare these terms of our series to these things. So AM will be compared to AN, and then AM plus 1 will be compared to AN times R, and then AN plus 2 will be compared to AN times R squared, and then the general term, which will be AN plus I, I'm getting a little bit crowded, but never mind, will be compared to AN r to the i. And in this case, previously we had that all of the terms were going to be greater than their corresponding term of the geometric progression. However, in this case, these ones are all going to be bigger, 
So the inequality this time is going to be this way round. The reason being that all of these ratios are now strictly less than r, and both of these are in turn strictly less than 1. So when you're multiplying by something less than 1, things are getting smaller. So the fact that this ratio is smaller than this ratio means that the amount by which this is going to get smaller is greater than the amount that this is getting smaller. So this one's always going to be greater than this one because you've multiplied it by something slightly bigger or less small than what you were multiplying it by. Again, when you multiply here, this ratio is now smaller than r. So this one is now going to be smaller than if you take this one and multiply it by r. So all of these terms are going to be smaller, strictly smaller than their corresponding term here. It means that when you add them all together, the thing that you get is going to be smaller than all of these terms of the geometric series added together. So now let's just have a brief aside to look at the geometric series. So if we're considering something of the form um, r uh, to the power of i, where i in this case goes from 0 to infinity because we want to include the first term, so we want the 1, uh, which is i to the, when i is equal to 0, r to the power of 0, plus r, plus r squared, plus etc. Now, the way that we work this out is by thinking about the partial sum, so the sum from i is equal to 0 to n of r to the power of i is going to equal 1 plus r plus all the way up to r to the power of n. And the way that I like to remember how you do this is actually by writing it the other way around. So writing it as rn plus r to the n minus 1 plus all the way up to 1, or all the way down to 1. If you think about taking that and multiplying it by r minus 1, this is the way that I can remember how to do this in my head. I can visualize this in my head. So if someone asks me what the formula for the geometric series is and I don't have a piece of paper, I can visualize doing this in my head and arrive at the formula. Whereas before I saw someone show me this, I couldn't actually visualize it in my head. So I'm now going to share it with you in the hope that uh, you will like it as much as I do. So if you want to know what this is, you can imagine multiplying it by an r minus 1. Now if you multiply this out, of course, you're going to get all of these multiplied by the r and then all of them multiplied by the minus 1. And you can see that all the middle terms are going to cancel, so all you're going to end up with is r to the n plus 1 minus 1. So r times r to the n gives you the r to the n plus 1, and then the minus 1, there's no, there's no r to the n plus 1 for the minus 1 to multiply with. So that's not going to cancel. But all of the in-between terms are going to cancel because you're going to have a minus r to the power of n from this. And then you're going to have a plus r to the power of n from this multiplying by this. Um, and then the final term that isn't going to cancel is then the 1 times the minus 1, which has no corresponding positive term to cancel with. But all the other terms are going to cancel. So then quite simply, uh, the value of this is just going to equal r to the n plus 1 minus 1 divided by r minus 1. So that's a cool way of remembering how you can get to that formula for the sum of a geometric, a finite geometric series. So to then work out what the infinite series is, you just then need to take the limit as n approaches infinity. Now, this is why r is required to be something of modulus less than 1, because if it doesn't have modulus less than 1, this thing blows up to infinity, or negative infinity. Um, but if the modulus is less than 1, then this thing shrinks down to 0, and therefore you just end up with what's left. Now, if we consider the case where r is positive, then uh, r minus 1 is going to be negative, so we might as well rewrite this as 1 over 1 minus r, which is the normal formula we have for the geometric series, the infinite geometric series. So in our case, r is indeed positive, and it's less than 1. So if we want to sum up this infinite series here, it is going to be, we can just factor out the mod an, and then we're going to get that it's equal to mod an over 1 minus r. So that's that infinite series added up. So now all of these bits here, their sum is going to be less than that. So then the entire thing, the sum of all of these, is going to be 
the sum of this bit plus this, and it's going to be less than that. So if we make some more space. So the sum then from i is equal to 1 to infinity of mod ai, it's going to be less than the sum from i is equal to 1 to not infinity to uh, big N minus 1 of the AIs, and that's some finite sum. That's the sum of all of these terms out the front, and that just adds up to something finite. Uh, and of course, we've dropped the absolute value sign there, so it should have that. Plus mod AN over 1 minus R. So we have bounded the value for this above and now we know it's a monotonically increasing sequence of partial sums because all the terms of the series are positive then it's the sequence of partial sums just gets bigger and bigger and bigger it's monotonically increasing and then by the monotone convergence theorem in the real numbers any monotonically increasing sequence is going to converge as long as it's bounded above and it's going to converge to its least upper bound uh, so this thing is indeed going to converge so what we have managed, therefore, to show is that if this is true, then this thing's absolute version converges, and therefore it is absolutely convergent, and this thing converging implies that this converges by the argument that I've already given. So we therefore have that this converges. So if rho is less than 1, you do have that that converges. Now time for the final case, so the case when... Uh, rho is equal to 1 and we want to show how it's inconclusive in this case so the way that we're going to prove that is we're going to show two examples one which is non-convergent and one which is convergent so we'll go up here I think so a really simple example of one that quite clearly does not converge is the sum where you set all the terms equal to 1 so from i is equal to 1 to infinity so all the ai's are equal to 1 so this is just the series 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus infinity. Now, quite clearly, that goes off to plus infinity. But if you look at the limit of the ratio between the terms, the ratio between all of the terms is just equal to 1. And therefore, that sequence of ratios is just 1, 1, 1, 1. And that sequence does have a limit, and that limit is 1. So it's an example of a series where rho is equal to 1, which doesn't converge. Now for an example where rho equals 1, but it does converge. So a really famous example here. So I'm going to change actually, not i, let's do n now. Sum from i, sorry, sum from n is equal to 1 to infinity, just because it looks odd if you put i for this one, of 1 over n squared, a very, very famous infinite series. So this is 1 over 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 9 plus 1 over 16, plus 1 over 25. Now this does converge. Some of you might even know what this converges to. This has a famous name. It is the Riemann zeta function evaluated at 2. So it's zeta 2. And it does have an amazing value that it converges to. Uh, we're not interested in what it actually converges to. We're not going to discuss that here. Instead, we're just interested in the fact that it converges and the fact that in its case, rho is going to equal uh, 1. So let's show firstly that rho is equal to 1. So the ratio between the terms then, all the terms are going to be positive so we don't need to worry about the absolute value. So rho is just going to equal the limit as n approaches infinity of the term n plus 1 which is 1 over n plus 1 squared divided by the subsequent term which it, or the previous term which is 1 over n squared. So, of course, that's the limit as n approaches infinity of n over n plus 1 squared. Um, and that is clearly going to equal 1, but if you need more convincing of that, what we can do is rewrite that slightly. So, it's the limit as n approaches infinity of, let's write it as 1 minus 1 over n plus 1 squared. Um, and again, hopefully you can now appreciate that this thing's going to shrink to zero as n approaches infinity, so you're just going to end up with 1 squared. If you need further convincing still, what you could do is multiply this out. So you could multiply it out to 1 minus 
2 over m plus 1 plus 1 over m plus 1 squared. And then this limit is just going to be the limit of this plus the limit of this bit plus the limit of this bit. And clearly those two are going to shrink to 0 as n approaches infinity. So it is just going to equal 1. So yes, this limit is equal to 1. So rho is equal to 1 in this series' case. Now, we're not going to show what this equals to. That's a totally different story. It's a wonderful story, but it's a different story. We're just going to show that it does converge. And the way that we're going to show that is by showing that it's bounded above. So again, it's a series of all positive terms. So the sequence of partial sums is therefore going to be monotonically increasing. So in order to prove that it converges, all you need to do is show that it's bounded above. So um, then by the monotone convergence theorem, it will converge to something. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to bound it by another series. And the other series we're going to pick is the sum of 1 over n, n minus 1. And in this case, we can't go from n is equal to 1 because then you'll be dividing by 0. But instead, we'll go from n is equal to 2, and that's good enough. So just to write out a few of the terms here. So this is going to be 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1 over um, 3 times 2 plus 1 over 4 times 3, etc. Now, this is actually very easy to work out the value of because it telescopes, so we can split this up using partial fractions and write it as, make sure you get this the right way around. I think it's this, but we'll just make sure of that. So if we combine that back together, we'd multiply this by n, and we multiply this by n minus 1, so we get n minus n minus 1. The n's would cancel, and then you get plus 1. Yes, this is fine. So we can rewrite this like so. So that's just basic algebraic manipulation. And why is that so clever? Because now look at what this is equal to. So it's going to be 1 over 2 minus 1, which is 1 minus 1 half. That's the first term. And then add on the second term, which will be 1 over 3 minus 2, which is 2 minus 1 over 3 plus the next term, which will be 1 over 4 minus 1, which will be 3 minus 1 over 4. And then it continues, and you can see what's going to happen. All of these terms are going to cancel, so that negative a half cancels with the plus a half, that negative a third cancels with the plus a third. And you can see that it's going to continue on in this way. So if we then think about what the partial sums are going to equal, and let me go back to the white pen, which shows it better. So if we think about the sum from n is equal to 2 to some k of this, 1 over n minus 1 minus 1 over n, that's just going to equal, well, you'll have the first term, this term that doesn't cancel with anything, so you'll have 1 minus, and then you'll have the final term, which won't have cancelled yet, which will be minus 1 over k. So that is the answer for those partial sums. So then if you want the infinite series, you just take the limit as k approaches infinity. Clearly that goes to zero as k approaches infinity. So this is uh, equal to one. So the sum is equal to one. Now, why is this helpful for us? So let's go up here. We wanted to work out, or we wanted to bound, not work out this series. n is equal to one to infinity, which is one over, and now I'm gonna write it as one times one plus 1 over 2 times 2 plus 1 over 3 times 3 plus 1 over 4 times 4. Well, now we can write, in fact, we've got this series underneath here, and we can compare certain terms. Now, we have nothing to compare the first term to, but that's okay. That's just one term, and that's equal to 1. So don't worry about that. But these other terms, we can compare them to their corresponding terms here from this series that we know the answer to. And can you see that all of these things down here are going to be bigger than their corresponding term up here? Because here, what you've done to each of them is you've reduced the size of this thing here. So this one's come down from 2 to 1. This one's gone from 3 to 2. This one's gone from 4 to 3, and so on. The next one would be plus 1 over 5 times 5. And down here, it would be plus 1 over five times four. Now, you're therefore making the denominator down here smaller than the denominator up here, and therefore 
the smaller the denominator is, the bigger the number you're going to end up with after you've divided by it. So all of these divisions are going to yield smaller numbers than these. So there's an inequality here. All of these are less than their corresponding term down here. More generally, if we, oh, sorry about that, it's going all over the place. So more generally, if we look at this 1 over n squared term, this is going to be less than the corresponding term down here, which is 1 over n, n minus 1. And that means that when you sum up all of these terms, it's going to be always less than the corresponding sum down here. So when it's the infinite sum, it's therefore going to be less than what the infinite sum of all of these added up to, and we know that that is 1. So therefore, we just then need to remember this first term here, and we've therefore got that this sum is going to be bounded above by 2. So we've done what we needed to do. It's a monotonically increasing sequence of partial sums, and it's bounded above by 2, and therefore it will converge to something that is between 0 and 2. In fact, you can say between 1 and 2. Um, so there we go. So there's an example of a very, very famous infinite series where rho is equal to 1, which does converge to a limit. So we've had an example where it doesn't, and an example where it does. So you can't conclude either way in the case that rho is equal to 1. So we will finish the video there. That was the aim of the video, to explain why the ratio test works. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've learned something.